Bonjour, donc euh, on est prêt pour la seconde présentation. Le second présentateur va être euh, Mathieu Blanchette. Donc, euh, Mathieu Blanchette euh, a initial, initialement commencé son parcours académique à l'Université de Montréal. Il a fait un bac en maths informatique ici à l'UDM et a ensuite poursuivi avec une maîtrise euh, en informatique avec David Sankoff ici à l'Université de Montréal, avant d'ensuite aller à l'Université de Washington pour faire un doctorat avec Martin Tampa. Il a ensuite poursuivi avec un cours postdoc à la très mythique UCSC avec euh, David Osler pour ensuite euh, joindre l'Université McGill en tant que prof d'informatique en 2002. Euh, parmi euh, les nombreux euh, prix que Mathieu a pu gagner dans sa vie, euh, euh, je pense que c'est important de mentionner au moins un, qui est essentiellement le prix Nobel de bioinformatique, le Overton Prize, <rire> en 2006. Donc Mathieu est l'un des 19 récipiendaires de ce, de ce prix-là. Il va nous parler aujourd'hui de, de génomique et d'évolution euh, avec algorithmique et apprentissage automatique. Mathieu. C'est peut-être le prix Nobel pour les moins de 23 ans ou quelque chose comme ça. Euh, merci beaucoup Sébastien. Euh, ça me fait très plaisir d'être ici avec vous pour euh, pouvoir euh, parler un peu des, des travaux qu'on fait. Euh, je pense que je vais continuer en anglais, ça va être plus facile pour moi et peut-être plus facile pour certaines personnes ici. Euh, mais euh, je veux remercier les organisateurs, euh, Joseph, euh, Sébastien, Margarita et s'il y en a d'autres que j'oublie, je... Excuse, ça me fait, c'est une série qui est, qui est uh, très, très importante pour, pour uh, le domaine à, à Montréal. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll continue in English. Uh, the difficulty in giving a talk after an imaging guy is that all your slides look very bland, especially if they're DNA sequences and your background looks very white. But uh, please bear with me. So this talk is going to be a little bit more uh, uh, technical and certainly Uh, less on the health side and a little bit more on the fundamental science side, although the health applications are not far uh, behind. Uh, do interrupt me at, at any point, really, because I'm not sure of the background of the people here. Uh, I'll quickly introduce the, the notions of uh, biology that we're interested in, but very quickly, because I think those are pretty uh, basic and the population, the people here should probably know all of this or much of this. Uh, our genome is a very, very long piece of DNA of which different pieces have different functions. Uh, the uh, most well-known functions uh, encoded in portions of our genome are the genes whose job is to encode things like proteins or other uh, non-coding uh, regions. But Uh, the expression of, expression of those genes needs to be uh, regulated by other uh, regions of our genome whose job is to activate or deactivate or tune up or down uh, the expression of genes under different uh, circumstances uh, or in different cell types. Uh, when uh, a gene is expressed, it produces a transcript, which is an RNA molecule, and and the life of that RNA molecule is also needs to be regulated in order for the right amount of proteins to be produced at the right locations and so on and so on. And so there's many, many different layers of regulation that are going on uh, in, in our cells. Uh, and actually that's been the focus of uh, much of uh, the work in our lab, uh, studying how computer science, bioinformatics and machine learning more recently Uh, how those approaches can help us understand those regulatory mechanisms. Now, of course, uh, the main way to study those mechanisms is to do lab experiments uh, of very, very many different types. Molecular biologists have been extremely clever and resourceful in coming up with all kinds of technologies to map different types of important functional elements of our genome, and that's the food that us uh, uh, bioinformatics and machine learning people are, are, are feeding upon, that we're trying to learn from. And so I'm not going to go in, in any of the details here, but there's a lot of uh, good data out there. Much of it is public data that, that people can use to train or, uh, different types of uh, machine learning approaches. Now these machine learning approaches are Uh, well, okay, are important because these experimental approaches have certain limitations. Uh, they are trying to study a very, very broad set of uh, mechanisms 
uh, going from all kinds of regulatory uh, mechanisms to, to protein function. So there's, there's uh, dozens and dozens of different types of uh, functions that different portions of DNA or RNA uh, sequences might have. We want to map those functions over very, very large sequences. The entire human genome is uh, 3 billion nucleotides long. Uh, those functions might be cell type specific, so what we see happening in, in a neuron might not happen uh, or might happen differently in a muscle cell. Uh, and uh, maybe that's the w killer of all of these challenges, is that we all have different genomes, uh, slightly different genomes, and so uh, even though we might uh, study a particular process in a certain cell type, that might not absolutely translate to each of us. And so if we had a computational approach to look at anyone's genome and be able to make predictions about a function or about the change of function caused by a mutation, uh, or if we had these, if these approaches were sufficiently interpretable that they could actually generate hypotheses that can be tested in the lab, then we would be better off. Uh, we could spend a little bit less money doing experiment uh, and learn more out of them and maybe generalize better. So that's uh, the rationale for the kind of work that we're doing. The type of question that uh, I'm going to be discussing today is a very generic, generic kind of uh, bioinformatics question. Uh, it's the following. I call it the sequence to function pr uh, prediction task. I give you a sequence. Maybe it's a DNA sequence or uh, a relatively short DNA sequence, let's say a few hundred bases, or maybe an RNA sequence or maybe a protein sequence. And my goal is to ask you to tell me if that sequence has a certain property that I'm interested in, yes or no. Kay, so it's a binary classification problem. Uh, I, I give you a piece of DNA and I ask you, will this piece of DNA be bound by a particular transcription factor in a particular cell type? Or uh, will this messenger RNA be localized to the mitochondria in neurons? Or um, in, uh, any kind of uh, functional uh, prediction question can be formalized in that way, and, and sometimes those questions are not binary questions, but it, they're more quantitative. So how much of an expression will be caused by the insertion of this sequence into the promoter of a gene, or uh, what's the half-life of, of this particular RNA sequence? So all of these are questions that have been studied extensively for which there's good amounts of data, uh, experimental data, that allows people in the machine learning field to train and develop predictive models. And there, there are really hundreds of those papers out there by now that are uh, building upon that experimental data to build uh, predictive approaches. Many of them are based on uh, convolutional neural nets and uh, recurrent neural nets, LSTMs in particular. Uh, with uh, Will Hamilton at, at McGill, we are looking at graph neural nets for structured molecules like RNAs, for example. But despite all of this work and all of this data available for training, there the accuracy is still pretty bad in almost all of these prediction tasks. Bad, not worse than what a human could do. So it's not like uh, n like in the previous uh, presentation f where Reza from Reza where you could y there's a human who who could look at a, a, a picture and and tell you yes that's pneumonia or not. Here nobody can tell you except uh, uh, doing uh, the experiment. The bottom line is that we still have long way to go to make those computational approaches of prediction of function. Uh, from a sequence, uh, to make them really useful, we need to make them quite a bit better. Okay, uh, to give you a quick example, uh, we've worked uh, recently with uh, Eric Lecuyer, who's a University of Montreal uh, professor at the IRCM. Uh, he's interested in the localization of messenger RNAs within cells after they get, after a gene gets transcribed, the transcript for many RNAs gets transported to specific locations in the cell uh, to be translated at the right location, maybe at the mitochondria or at the uh, ER or so on. A and so that, that uh, helps localize the protein uh, where it's needed and it has other uh, benefits. So the question is, what does the cell recognize in the messenger RNA to take it to the right location? So that's a 
uh, perfectly classical uh, machine learning uh, kind of task because we can uh, take data. There are, there are some of these genomics approaches that are based on taking cells and fractionating them in their different components and then sequencing the RNA that's found in each of those components. And then we can ask, okay, could we have predicted where a given transcript will end up uh, based on, on its sequence and its structure? Okay, and uh, we've developed, uh, uh, so here's a, a little uh, architecture that uh, my student uh, Zi Chao Yan has uh, developed. And it's a pretty classical uh, uh, architecture in this field. Uh, uh, convolutional neural net, uh, uh, a few layers of uh, convolutional layers, uh, an LSTM to integrate information from uh, across the sequence, an attention layer, and you stack them together, you, you do that in some moderately clever way, and you get some moderately good results. Good enough that you can publish them, but that's sh but maybe not good enough to make much else out of it. So, for example, this shows you each dot here is a gene. Along the x-axis you have the location or how much of that gene was found in a particular location in the cell, uh, whereas uh, the y-axis is how much it was predicted uh, or what, what the, the predictor uh, predicted would be the localization. And do you'd like that to be a perfect correlation? And there is some correlation, but it's not really that good. Okay, so that's not really what I want to be talking about. What I want to talk about is why there it's not so good and what can we do to actually make it better. Um, and the main reason it's not that good is that, as you know, uh, these deep learning approaches, they need a lot of training data to be able to learn sophisticated concepts that th they can then apply uh, su successfully to, to new data points. And in this field and in biology in general, data d is, is not cheap. And in many cases, data is available in finite amount and no matter how much you spend, you will just never uh, f uh, have more. In particular, so if we look, for example, uh, at the problem of uh, predicting the subcellular localization of RNAs. Well, in the human genome, there are 20,000 trans uh, genes, let's say. So we'll have 20,000 measurements. We will never have more because there's just not more genes uh, in, in the human genome. Uh, and if our goal is to predict a particular type of localization, something really, really uh, precise, uh, we might, and, and we do have cases of some things that we're really interested in, but we only have 10 examples, 10 genes that exhibit a particular localization pattern. And so that's never going to be enough to train any kind of deep models. So the question is, what can we do about that? And I'll try to answer that or provide some, some elements of answer now. Okay, and once again, yeah, so these limitations are not, it's not about spending more money acquiring data, it's just that this data does not exist, at least it doesn't exist within the human genome. Okay, now um, <laughs> we'll play a little game to try to make a point here. Um, the point that I'm going to make is that the data that I've been talking about until now, I will call it static data. It's a snapshot of what humans are today. And it's static in contrast to what I'll tell you in a second. But to make the point about, uh, and just for fun, uh, so here's a static picture of some coral reef or something like that. And now if I ask you, okay, what do you see in this picture? Uh, well, okay, there are certain things you recognize. There's this big red fish there and there's some coral heads and so on. Uh, but there are some things that are much easier to do. Let me see if I can start that. Uh, it's much easier to do if you see this uh, picture in motion over time. You see that certain things start moving in ways that were unexpected when you were just looking at it from a static uh, angle. Okay, so uh, we're going to try to take advantage of this. The point that is that uh, by, by watching something that we want to understand evolve over time, we might be able to do a much better job at understanding what it is that it does, what, are, what is it that we're looking at, uh, and, well, okay, how are we going to do that with genomes? We cannot look at the genome evolving over time, we could do that, but it would take 
a long, long time before we would see enough action. But what we can do is look back in time and take advantage of the fact that our genome today is the result of uh, so roughly a, a, a billion years of evolution. And if we had the luxury of looking back in time and seeing how our genome became what it is today, then maybe we, we would have something like, like that, that movie that I was showing. So uh, now fortunately, uh, people in the genomics and evolution uh, community have been sequencing the genomes of uh, many, many uh, species related to humans, in particular vertebrates. Uh, and uh, in this talk, we're going to make use of the first batch of those uh, uh, mammalian genomes that were sequenced in the last 10 years or so. Uh, so there's 59 of those. So and they, they're listed here in the phylogenetic tree here. So uh, this is going to be the start of our attempt to recreate that movie that I was showing you, movie of, of, of DNA sequences evolving in time. And then once we'll have done that, I'll tell you how we can take advantage of that movie to uh, understand function. So this here, it's very small, but it's just a little piece of the human genome. What I'm going to show you is that, well, I told you that we actually now have access to the genomes of 59 other mammals. We can align those genomes to the human genome because they're not so, so different. For example, the human and chimp genomes are 99% identical. The human and uh, dog genomes are, are not that uh, similar, but still similar enough that we can figure out how to align them to each other. And so we can take any portion of the human genome about which we want to ask a particular question and figure out what that portion looked like in all of those other uh, genomes by extracting this out of a big multiple genome alignment. Okay, So from this, there's already a lot of things that we can take advantage of in order to make function predictions. And I'm not going to spend very much time on this, but the, 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 the work that people have been doing for the last uh, 30 years, or the, the idea that people have been ad taking advantage of, is that regions of the genome that are very important tend to be more conserved than those that are not, in cons uh, not, uh, or not as important. Uh, or critical to fitness. And in fact, what you see here is on the left of the alignment, there's a high degree of conservation. On the right, there's less conservation. In fact, the left is, the, uh, is a, an exon a very of a very important gene. The right part is an intron. So already from this very basic measure of just seeing what's conserved and what's not, you can get a feel for what's important and what's not, but not so much about the function itself. You can just say, oh, the left part looks like it's doing something important, the right part maybe less so. Okay, now to go a step further, uh, well, actually, let's go back to the movie idea. So the movie idea was a sequence of frames ordered in time uh, that we watch from the beginning to the end. Uh, this here, these are the sequences of a particular region across multiple species, this, is, this does not form a movie because these are not consecutive frames over time. These are, in some sense, they are 59 different endings of a movie that played over a hundred billion or uh, a billion year uh, long movie. Okay. Um, well, actually, uh, uh, here, if we're looking only at mammals, it's more like the hundred, last hundred million years. So this is not a movie. These are a hundred or 59, sorry, uh, endings for a movie. If we wanted a movie, we would need to have uh, access to uh, the sequence of ancestral species. So all of those nodes that are along the, 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 the path that goes from human back to uh, the root. But of course, those are uh, DNA sequences of uh, species that are no longer around. Although it is possible in some cases to sequence old DNA, this is much older than what we can actually extract DNA from. So uh, we don't have access to that information. However, uh, we've spent a lot of efforts in the last 15 years uh, at what's going on here. Hmm. 
okay. I will stop this. Okay, uh, so we sp we've done a lot of uh, work on the genomics and evolution side to take the genomes of these species that live today and compare them in the right way in order to be able to infer what the sequence of ancestral nodes in this tree look like. So basically for every tree, every node in the uh, phylogeny of mammals, we can predict what that the genome of that species was. And the reason why it's doable is that although mammals are very diverse, they're not so, so diverse. There's we can still compare the genomes of different species and for the most part uh, understand what's related to what, what or what, uh, what's the ortology relations. And from this, and given the particular topology of the, of the tree of uh, mammals, we can uh, make actually pretty accurate predictions about what uh, these ancient genomes were. Now, that's a whole other story that I don't want to get into. What I want to talk about, really, is not about how we can make predictions about the, the ancestral sequences, but why would we want to do this? And this is one of the coolest reasons. We could actually synthesize that DNA and uh, grow the organisms from it, but that's not really the point today. What I want to do instead is to tell you how we can make use of that information. Uh, and we're going to make use of it. Well, basically, that's going to be the movie that I was showing you. But how are we going to really take advantage of it in order to go back to a practical task of understanding uh, what is the function of that region or what is the, c the consequence of that mutation? And to make my point, I will try to uh, play that little, little game with you, um, which is the following. Uh, we're going back to an image uh, analysis uh, task here, and the task is the following. Can you take look at the picture of a person and or a politician and uh, predict if that person is a left wing or a right wing uh, person? Okay, and I'm giving you a training set here of five examples. Uh, and this is not, uh, uh, I'm not trying to make um, sophisticated political points here. I'm uh, not even sure that my labels are correct, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, from this data, can you recognize what in the picture of a person uh, would allow you to recognize if that person is a left-wing or a right-wing politician? I'll let you think about it. I pretend that I have not heard anything from you. So, some people are extremely insightful. And most of them, hopefully most of you, would say what I would have said uh, presented with this is that there's no way to answer this question because um, I have too little training data. Okay, uh, If you don't know these people, there's, you cannot generalize from uh, only five examples. It could be something about the color of the background or whether they have a, a color in their shirt or I don't know. C there's a million possible explanations. Okay, all right. Now this here is obviously uh, the analog of my ten examples of my ten sequences that are localized in this particular way, of which I would really like to be able to understand what makes them localized in that manner. But I have too little data to a to be able to uh, generalize. Okay, I'm going to give you more data now. Here's the pictures of uh, ancestors and relatives of the people that I showed you originally. Okay, so now you have a, a dozen people, and um, I don't know what the uh, political uh, allegiance of these people are. Some people I, I might not know, um, but I'm going to assume, and it's not going to be such a bad assumption that. These ancestors and relatives, they probably have the same political allegiance as the few examples that I had, uh, for which I had labels at the bottom. So, uh, although I don't have uh, perfect labels for those ancestors and maybe relatives, uh, I have a, a certain idea. So now that you have more data, now can you tell what it is about a person's picture that allows you to tell if they're left-leaning or right-leaning? And because you gave the answer uh, from the first five examples, uh, and that was the correct answer, I'll let you t tell us what the answer is. Okay, uh, they're looking left. 
Okay, so yes. So the, the, the left-leaning politicians are looking le on the left side. They're actually it's the opposite, but yeah, that was just to keep you on your toes. Um, so yes, left-leaning, uh, uh, looking right, and so on. So, um, okay. S uh, so now the point is, with enough data, you would have been able to tell that. Okay. Now, this is not a, per a classical... A, uh, machine learning setting, however, because these examples are related to one another. We cannot assume that uh, uh, an ancestor and its descendant are independent examples. They're not. They're closely related, depending on, on how close th they are to each other. And we cannot also assume that an ancestor or a sibling necessarily will always have the same polit political allegiance as the, the, the original person we're uh, look at. And so that makes for a family of, of machine learning problems that are interesting and challenging. And now I'm going to go back to my uh, uh, my sequence to function prediction task, and I'm going to uh, give two examples, more more uh, practical examples of how we're actually going to uh, make use of evolutionary information in order to improve our ability to make function prediction. The first one is going to be what we call the phylogenetic manifold regularization. And that will aim to train better models by using this evolutionary information. And the second one is going to be uh, uh, aiming at using is existing trained models, but making better, uh, mu better use of them by uh, taking, again, advantage of the data that comes from multiple species. And here's the, the general idea. It's kind of re restating uh, the example we gave before. If I have, I want to learn what distinguishes the green transcripts from the red transcripts in this data set of four examples, there's uh, so many different decision boundaries that I cannot, uh, I would have to be extremely lucky to pick the correct one. But if I bring in uh, the information about Re related or ancestral sequences, and if I'm willing to make the assumption that the function of those ancestral and related sequences is unlikely to have changed, then I can I can increase my the size of my data significantly and hopefully learn a much better decision boundary that will generalize better. And because we have access to uh, something like well, uh, actually 120. Uh, orthologous and ancestral sequences for each of the human examples. It's effectively boosting the size of our training set by 120 fold. Although we should not really think of it that way because they're not truly independent examples. It's not worth as much as 120 times the data, but it's worth more than nothing, which is what people have made use of this data so far. Okay, so very quickly, um, the first idea that I'm going to introduce is based on the idea of uh, uh, phylogenetic manifold reg regularization. What does that mean in simple terms? It means that the function of a piece of DNA or RNA usually tends to not change over time or to change slowly. So as the sequence evolves, the sequence, the nucleotides can mutate, but usually selective pressure is such that the, the changes in the function of that sequence will be rare or will be small, although there will be exceptions where a big change will happen I in the function. So if we, uh, if we want to train a good predictor of function, uh, one property of that good predictor should be that the, uh, the prediction scores that it makes on related examples should be similar to each other. They should be relatively smooth over, the, bra over the, the nodes of my tree because we don't expect large changes in function to occur too often. So if we applied a certain predictor to the, the, the sequences in my tree here and we got the scores that are here, that are numbers between 0 and 1, and we do the same thing on the right, we'll see that on the left, that predictor assigns vastly different scores to different nodes in the tree, which would translate it evolutionarily into uh, this function having changed largely at many, many times uh, in the tree, which would be unlikely 
compared to the one on the right, where the scores evolve in a more gradual manner, which would be more uh, evolutionarily realistic. And so what we're going to do is uh, introduce uh, a notion of regularization, that is this uh, notion of smoothness over the branches of the tree. So we're going to take any type of machine learning approach that aims at minimizing a certain loss function. So the, the, uh, in yellow on the left, you have your classical loss function that could be a, a cross entropy term or of sum of squared errors or whatever. And then we're going to add a regularization term that penalizes predictors that make predictions that hop, that change very quickly from one node to the other because we know that this should not be happening. So it's just a way to say, uh, to, uh, to tell a predictor to, to uh, uh, be smooth over the, the evolutionary times. And that's actually enough to uh, push the, these predictors into the right direction. I should emphasize that a great point about this whole thing is that on the, the term on the right, which is the, the what we call the phylogenetic regularization term, it is independent of any label. We don't need label data from this. All we have is, is we need examples from uh, multiple different species. And uh, all this is saying is that we don't want the predictions to change too much. It's only the, uh, the part of the loss function on the left that requires uh, labeled data. So when we train, uh, so what, okay, what does that mean? That means that this approach is applicable to any kind of uh, machine learning approach that's aiming at minimizing a loss function. We're just changing slightly that loss function. So a simplest example would be a logistic regression predictor. And we've uh, shown that uh, for a certain task, in this case, it's a transcription factor binding site prediction task. Along the x-axis, you have the standard approach. The y-axis, you have the same approach, but with this regularization term. And you gain uh, a lot in terms of the accuracy of the predictions. Uh, not enough still to make it really, really practical today, but it's by adding multiple of those ideas together that eventually we'll get there. We can do the same thing with any kind of predictor. This is a, a, a convolutional neural net that was proposed uh, a few years back for the same task and simply retraining it with that new loss function boosts uh, that accuracy. So there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it's a very, very simple idea, but it's very uh, attractive from the practical point of view because we don't need to reinvent anything. We are just taking clever ideas of clever architectures that have been shown to work relatively well, and then we're just uh, training it using a lot more data, using that regularization term, making use of 100, bil no, 100 million years of evolution and selection in order to uh, weed out the better models and uh, the, the ones that are less powerful. You have a question. The topology of the tree is is we're considering as as uh, given to us ahead of time and uh that's not too much of an assumption in the context of models that that tree has been worked out and it's applicable essentially for to every region of the genome if we were applying this to bacteria uh it might be less uh less true and more problematic okay so we can oh yes Alors, d'abord, uh, okay, je réponds en anglais. So, so the question is, uh, can we use quantum computers to uh, to speed things up? Uh, and I, okay, my answer, my real answer is, I really don't know because I'm. It's quite a different uh, set of skills that are needed to do that. My understanding at this point is that whatever uh, computers exist are still extremely, extremely limited in what they can do today. So the answer today is absolutely certainly not in. 15, 20 years from now, quite possibly. But you know, 
well, they have access to something that can do some things, but not every potential uh, tasks. I don't know, or I might be missing something big, but uh, we can talk about it afterwards. Okay. Uh, but I think here, the main problem is not, it's not a computational problem. It's not about being faster. I even if we had uh, a power uh, computer that is a billion times faster, it would not change anything. It's more of a statistical or information content thing. If, if I just gave you these five pictures of these five guys, no matter how much computation power you have, you're still not going to be able to tell which of the thousand po of possible features uh, uh, lets you distinguish between the... Okay. okay, so let's go back to those guys. And let's look at the person on the right now. So the person on the right is neither looking left nor right. Uh, so if you, even if you had a great predictor that you've trained maybe all using the, 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 the data on the left and their ancestors, that predictor would be uncertain about how to classify this one example uh, in the middle. Uh, now, the point I want to make today is that if you look at the ancestors of this person, they are all looking right, which means that they would be left-leaning. And so if you're willing to uh, assume that most of the time... Uh, the political alle allegiance uh, remains the same, then you should make use of the information about the ancestors or the relatives to classify this person. Okay, And so that's what we're going to do here. And I, I'm going to go pretty quickly because it's, it's very straightforward. But suppose that you have a trained predictor for a particular function that you're interested in. You can apply that predictor. Let's say you want to classify a human sequence as having a function or not. You apply it to that function. Maybe that's the red node in my phylogenetic tree. That's what I call the uh, target species. And in the example I just gave you, that predictor is uncertain about the function of that sequence. But you also apply it to uh, the sequence of, of uh, the orthologous sequences in other species. You get all of these scores assigned to each of those nodes that correspond to different uh, uh, relat related species or different ancestors. And now the question is, can you combine all of those scores to improve your ability to determine whether that human sequence is or has that function or not? And here we're just showing a simple probabilistic approach that uh, models the, the changes in those scores uh, depending on whether or not the label of that example is, uh, is zero or one. And by doing a simple uh, log likelihood test, we can actually significantly and very easily, once again, very easily uh, boost the accuracy of a pre-trained uh, predictor. In this case, that was our uh, uh, RNA subcellular localization predictor. And so, again, a very simple thing. Here, we're not even training uh, we're not e retraining anything, we're taking something out of the box, applying it to not just human sequences but others in order to improve by quite a substantial margin. These, these gains here, that uh, these numbers look small, but they're actually, uh, well, every new paper in the field improves by 1%, so getting 3 or 4% improvement is quite significant. And once again, that's still not enough to make it of great immediate practical use, but it's by accumulating these ideas that we'll get there. Um, so, okay, I think I'll skip this. Th so, th But the, the key point about both of the approaches that I've described is that they're, they're not reinventing the wheel, they're just applying simple ideas that can be uh, applied on top of existing uh, uh, architectures to simply boost their accuracy, either train better models or make uh, better use of those models. And because the uh, amount of data coming from related species is going to increase and increase over time because more and more genomes are being sequenced, uh, the, these approaches will gain in power at a relatively small cost uh, in, in terms of, of uh, computational power. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, the work that I presented is largely the work of two of my uh, students, uh, Faizi Asan and Zichao Yan, although it's also the result of collaborations with a number of other labs. I'll mention the Doina Precups lab and Francois Laviolette, uh, Alexandre Wayne and, and uh, Will Hamilton in particular. And I will now take questions if there are any. Thank you. 
Yes. No, no, you're good. What have we done? Nothing clever. We're, we've just actually, I think the one clever thing we've done is to say uh, and realize, and we're not the first ones to realize that, but to realize that uh, evolution is a really, really powerful experiment that's been running for a really, really long, and that tells us a lot more than what we're, what, what we've until now been able to extract from it. So uh, the fact that certain mutations will change a phenotype and many will not is not easy to to recognize when you have uh, when you look at a relatively short evolutionary skills but if you have the luxury of looking at a hundred times more evolutionary time because you have a much bigger tree then you start to be able to recognize pattern and then it's not you it's it's your see your, your your neural networks that are able to to do that a little bit better uh, and it's it's really just more data but not just more data more data that is a result of selection because the, the the genomes we observe today we observe them because they've survived these hundred million years so they're not a random subset of of sequences they're the result of selection it's and it's by taking advantage of that process that we gain i think the the little bit we showed you Are there other questions? <laughs> ah, yes, sorry. Uh, when you talked about we, d we don't have enough, uh, we don't have enough uh, information at the uh, at the leaf level, hmm. and you added the phylogenetic topology and the progression score. How much more data could it uh, create that you can use machine learning? <coughs> I didn't well, understand how did you create it that much? So, uh, if I go back to uh, one of our phylogenetic trees, uh, those trees have, so one of the leaves in these, let's look at this one here. One of the leaves in this tree here is the human sequence. And until now, or most approaches that were interested in predicting something in human were only using data from that one genome. Now, if we're using the data from, we're essentially multiplying by close to 100, the number of uh, sequences that we get to look at. S for each, well, so for each human sequence, we can identify the orthologous or corresponding sequence in 100 other species, and that's the data that, that we build on. Well, it's not sufficient. If there were, if we had access to more, we would gain more. But that's what what I showed you is what we get with the data we have today. Regions of the genome, like like coding regions, or all the conserved regions, or no. So in this case on, of this slide here, we actually have reconstructed reconstructed ancestor uh, uh, sorry complete uh, genomes. Uh, 
ancestral genomes, yes. Um, and that matters because the kind of functions we're interested in are mostly regulatory regions that are not often right next to a highly conserved gene or something like that. as a discovery tool for now. Uh, so the, okay, the question is, are we using this as a discovery? So discovery I interpret as aiming to understand the mechanisms that are making a certain uh, sequence uh, having a particular function. So that's more what we're interested in at this point. But the, the prediction task is mostly of interest for me uh, in the context of predicting the impact of mutations because uh, that's something that we're still pretty bad at doing uh, and that would be extremely expensive to do on a large scale experimentally. But if we had a good predictive model, we can say, okay, what's the function of this? Okay, now if I mutate this nucleotide, does the function change? How does it change? If we were able to do that, then we would be able to interpret uh, your own genome and, and tell you a lot more about, about disease risks than we can today. That's right. When do you get to the analysis? Because as you know, every type of analytic pathway is a lot of processing. Actual models time is spent in a lot of standardized normalization. Yep. And one of the questions is you start, so for example, we address this a lot of time, at least we start after, because that's a whole other bag of beans. But then there's the issues, are we missing things because now we are already a little making assumptions and associations? Do you usually work in a raw raw data space? Um, it depends on the project. So in the projects with, uh, for example, Eric Liqui on uh, mRNA localization, we are working closely with him. We are doing, coming up with the right normalization approaches and realizing that they do matter and that they change a lot of things. Uh, in other cases, we're using public data that has been processed and normalized already. And then we're crossing our fingers that we're not uh, losing too much or that this has been done the right way. But the people who are Releasing that data are better at doing that than we would be. So, uh, but yes, that's a certainly a consideration that matters. That's all I can say. No, so it's well, so. The the objects that we operate on are still sequences of the same type as before. We just have more examples of those. So the dimensionality does not change. It's the number of examples that that does. Right. Yes. I wanted to ask a naive question before, and I realize it's probably too naive, but I want to ask but it, and then I want to take it a little further. So the naive question is, wouldn't it be possible to just build a model of the chemistry and try to understand from the chemistry of the DNA exactly yeah. what's happening? Now, I realize that that's naive because it's so complex, but is there room for combining the deep learning or the neural networks with such a model to actually get more out of it? Yeah, so there is. Um, the main challenge in, in uh, doing a physical modeling uh, of a system is that, uh, well, okay, each of the objects are pretty complex objects, but the bigger problem is that we're missing information about many, many of the uh, important actors. So uh, if we're interested in what localizes a particular transcript to the mitochondria, that involves hundreds of proteins and uh, moving along the microtubule. We're there's so many of those uh, important players that we would be so terrible at at uh, modeling that it it would make the whole thing almost pointless. Except if you can do that on a very very small uh, scale. If you're interested in one protein uh, setting the binding to one binding site, then people do uh, this this uh, uh, this mod this type of modeling. But on a larger scale, there's there's just too many unknowns in the in the components of the system. Well, both of both of them actually. There there are molecules that we 
may not suspect play any role in something that actually turned out to be important. And then there's the complexity issue of, of simulating the evolution of a system that has hundreds of thousands of different objects in it. Yes, yes. Uh, and for sure, uh, as we accumulate more and more knowledge, that approach becomes more and more attractive. Uh, but I think for, for these uh, kind of high level uh, um, functions like localization of an mRNA, I think uh, they're not going to win the race of, of, uh, of, of uh, which one will give us the, the useful information uh, anytime soon. But it's not a naive question at all. And, and integrating that with the, the machine learning approaches could be a really uh, interesting approach. And I, some people are looking in that direction. It would be particularly interesting because it would give you a mechanistic understanding of what's going on, uh, uh, which would be very valuable also. Okay. Yep, hi. Very interesting. Um, so considering, um, let's say, the, the data augmentation using orthologs, uh, my question would be more related to the fragments you're trying to classify. So let's say, for instance, on your maybe on your transcription factor binding problem, your fragments would be of a shorter length, maybe 100-ish. Yep. Uh, what if um, you're working on a problem that requires your question on sequence prediction P, your, your P question, is um, of a much longer length? Do you think there will be any effects of using orthologs, uh, that, that type of augmentation approach? Well, that, no so that's a very good question. Uh, the more focused your question can be on a particular region, the, the easier the question tends to be. But not every question can be answered or f even formulated in this way. Um, so there are uh, certain types of uh, functional questions, like if I'm thinking about the entire regulatory neighborhood of a gene that might include uh, 100,000 nucleotides around it. And I ask, OK, given all of this, how will the expression of a gene react when I give a particular drug or something? That's a question that, I to answer that question, you would need to look at uh, this entire large piece of sequence and its orthologs, which actually in itself does not pose a, a big problem. We can easily cut out the, the uh, orthologous regions of, of regions of any size, uh, but it certainly comes with a much bigger challenge on the machine learning side to to tease out the pieces of information that you need from this m big chunk of DNA. Yep. Oh yes. Uh, could it help instead of just one creating one um, ancestral genome? We do uh, multiple ancestral regional ancestral region and yes so in in this picture that we have here we have one ancestral sequence at every node or every internal node of the tree but so uh, for the entire genome yes multiple conserve region and we do multiple uh, ancestral region and we will have more trees and more? Well, I'm not sure, because the way we're using, so we're first computing a, this big alignment, and then we're cutting out little slices that interest us that correspond to regions that we care about. That's how we extract these orthologous sequences from other species. Okay. All right. Okay, so thank you, Mathieu. Thank you very much. <laughs>